Digital Taxidermy Video Tutorial. Hello everyone, right, or whoever you are, a uh, quick tutorial on how to make some cool renders of your STL files in Blender. I've got screencast keys down here, that will show you what you're doing. So first thing, uh, I would use the Cycles Renderer. So go over to this tab here, little picture of a camera, it'll j default to EV, you want it on Cycles. Quickly, if you've got a GPU, click, turn on GPU Compute. As a side note, you really want to go to preferences go to now what's it going to be under hold on you want to be going to your uh, preferences up here you want to go to system you want to check under CUDA and check that you have both your graphics card and your processor selected and then you're going to use both of them for your rendering and that's going to speed it up so I've got that you might have to turn them on and just save your preferences down there okay so so then we want to go GPU compute which will actually have your GPU and your CPU compute um, a few things I like to change. I like to change my light paths. Uh, I have heard it said you don't really need anything above 4. So have them all set to 4. It's how many, I think, bounces the ray tracing does. 4 is enough. Obviously more will give you a higher quality. But 4, for what we're doing, I think can be enough. Because we're not really using any glassy stuff like that. You don't need caustics on. You could actually turn them off. Unless you are using transparencies. But we don't need caustics. Um... To on under film, have it set to transparent. That's going to be your transparent background. That will be important later on. And the probably the most important one under performance, uh, it'll auto detect the number of cores you're using. But if you're using a GPU, smaller tiles, there the little squares appear when you're rendering with cycles. Smaller tiles work better with GPU because you've got loads of cores giving loads of cores a little bit of work to do. If you're just rendering with your CPU, you want bigger tiles because you've got less cores, but they're better at it. That's my understanding. Could be entirely wrong, but that's what I've been told. So I've set up cycles the way I like it. I'm then going to import myself some STL files. Uh, I haven't got anything ready. Let's go to what have we got. Let's say I'm doing something for... Um, there you go, I've found a load of files, I'm going to import them. i uh, just got to wait a second. They've appeared. Um, now, first thing that's going to happen when you import a file, this is something Neil has done. I'm going to select it. It's going to come in a weird orientation if you're just importing an STL because it's for printing. Uh, a quick word about Blender. Now, with these files I've imported, because they're for 3D printing, they come in pretty massive for Blender because it has a millimetre to a Blender unit, okay, which is pretty big and if i were to go to my camera view by pressing zero and actually let's just quickly talk about this for a second camera view what i like to do is get the camera to about the size i want if i'm doing something for my website i will know i want a square image so click on the little picture of a printer i'm not going to do anything too big but you can do whatever you want and do 600 by 600 because for a website i don't want them too big um, set it so it's nicely framed then go to view Go view, lock camera to view, and then I can move my camera around in 3D space. Now, actually, this isn't too bad, but you'll notice if I scroll too far away, it disappears. That's because in Blender, the camera has a clipping limit. So if I select my camera by clicking on the edge of the frame or by selecting the camera in this menu here, I can get up the camera options here, click that, and you'll see you have clip start, clip end, and that tells me I've got it set quite high as default, but often it would be quite low. But if I were to change this to... 2000 I can suddenly see more stuff and basically if you have it lower it probably speeds up the render time because it's not rendering as bigger area but we want it to render quite a big area what you could do instead if you want to keep your clipping distance quite low is select your object and press s for scale 0 0.1 oh select everything of course scale 0 0.1 and it makes it nice and small but that's a size that Blender is probably happier working with. And I can then turn my clipping distance way down. So I could turn my clip actually to like 200. And that's going to speed up my render time a little bit, probably. Although, I've never actually tested that, but that would be my theory. Then I'm just going to select everything. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees, get it up. Okay, so now... I could, I want to do a little teaser image for our website, talking about what's going to come up soon. So I'm just going to have like a little tiny picture. 
I'm going to weirdly place my camera. I wouldn't normally place my camera like this. So, got that all set up. Let's talk about the materials that we've got here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about materials for making some nice quick renders. Here's are the tricks I've learned. I'm going to go to the shader editor. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to slide this thing out of the way. By default, it has object, and you could add a material, a new material for this object here. Actually, let's add a material for this. This is going to be the spool. I'm just going to give that a black material. It's probably the only things for kind of plastic that I'm going to worry about for the spool is make it black. Roughness 0.5, that's sort of slightly shiny, that's fine. We're going to come on to the other materials later. Okay, so I'm going to talk, that's that material. For the other material that I'm going to do the shelf with, I'm going to talk about later. We're going to talk about ambient occlusion. But before then, I'm going to actually go to, this is the object bit of the shader editor. editor. I'm actually going to look at the world bit. Because if I were to go to Z and look at my rendered settings now, there's no lights, there's no anything, and yes, I could add a light, and I will add a light later on, and move it around, and I could set a bit of light, but I, there's a better way to do it. So, actually, what we're going to do is an HDRI, and HDRI is a high dynamic range image. I've got my daughter on my leg. Hold on. So, it's a picture that will create an environment for us, a 360 degrees picture. So, I need to do that, I need to go to hold on sorry I deleted a node there so this is on this side of the screen this is what the world editor thing so you get a background node that goes to your world output node I'm going to press shift a and I'm going to put an input uh, texture and it's going to be an environment texture so if I go to environment texture plug it in now everything goes purple because I've not plugged anything in I'm going to open up um, it's going to go to where I keep all my stuff which is in here. I have a little folder called HDRIs. If you we Google a website called HDRI Haven, they have some lovely HDRIs in there. So where do I put it? Oh no, I put it in a different folder, didn't I? Hold on. Uh, so this is it. This is your HDRI. There's some nice... So you want to download an HDRI file, open it up. It's going to look a little bit like this. You want the one that's called an .exr file. Open that up. And then suddenly, boom, we get some lovely colors if I were to go back to um, my cycle settings and turn off transparency you would see actually you get a lovely image all the way around but because I've got transparency on it gives me a transparent background which is what I want so that is sort of 90% of my lighting done if there were ever any interesting parts I wanted to chuck a little bit of light onto I could import I could create a point of light now, I find when they create a point of light, settings are over here on the right, um, they always put the power too low. I'm going to put it up to 300. There you go. And I might even give it a little bit of a colour, because let's make it a little bit orange and eerie. Ooh, a bit too green. That's nice. Looks a little bit candlelit. Okay, good. Obviously, have fun playing around with lights and strengths. You can, If you've got a light you like, you could shift D and duplicate it, move it round a bit few different places there we go that instantly makes give me a bit of light and shadow makes the image a bit more interesting okay so I am gonna then talk about textures for this thing here um, I've only got this texture this is gonna be oh no this texture here material let's go back from world to object now uh, how much how are we doing for time about eight minutes that's good let's talk about ambient occlusion and mixed nodes so with Blender, this is my principal shader. This gives me loads of information about how to make realistic um, materials. There's loads of stuff to do with roughness, and you can plug things into these nodes around here and make roughness maps and all stuff, some normal maps. I'm not going to worry about any of that now, although it is important, and there will be better tutorials about it. I'm going to turn the roughness down a little bit. Let's make it a little bit matte. Um, but it's, it's up to your choice. I'm going to shift A, put in a mix node. Uh, no, a mixed shader. Mixed shader. Bam. Put that in there. And I'm going to duplicate this. And I'm going to have one that's dark. It's going to be the colour for my shadowy bits. Because you want to have a bit of dark in your shadows. I'm going to keep the white one that's light. I'm going to make it a slightly off-white. By sort of dragging this around. Maybe bringing it down. You see. At the moment, it's just mixing. Let's make this a sort of muddy brown colour as well. There we go. Maybe a little bit. There we go. 
is just mixing the two and I can factor it one way or the other. But I want it to have them mixed and I want the dark colours and the crevices. So ambient occlusion. Ambient occlusion is an input you can bring in. Here's, it, here's the shader. Don't worry too much about the settings. The only thing you'd ever really change is the distance. But I'll get onto that. Um, ambient occlusion. If I were just to plug it in. Ambient occlusion is where two objects are close to each other. If they're close to each other. It occludes it. I don't know what these words mean. But it makes it. You can see already that we've got a little bit. That in the crevices of the bookcase have gone a little bit darker than they were before. If I turn it off. It's a flat colour now. We've got a little bit of dark in the crevices. Just makes the image a bit more interesting, a bit more dynamic. But I want more of that. So I'm actually going to chuck in a converter, a colour ramp. Colour ramps are the future. And I really want to... I'm going to bring that right across. And already you can see... Oh, that I've got it way too dark in some places and way too light in other places. But I'm going to add another one this just sort of changes how the curves work and i think actually this is a slightly unusual one i'm going to leave it there which isn't perfect but you can already see dark bits and light bits a bit image is a bit more interesting now i want to suddenly apply this texture to everything so i'm going to highlight all the other bits that i want to apply this texture to and then i'm going to highlight the thing i've textured last click on it so that is my highlighted lighter yellow thing. Click Control L, link, materials, boom, everything gets that material. We are getting there. Now let's just have, this is not, normally I would go for some sort of cool shot like this, but this is a work in progress thing that we're building at the moment. It's going to be for a Kickstarter later in the year. So I'm just going to do a little sneaky peek image. And I've talked about this with Neil, who was the other one at Digital Taxidermy. Maybe just having a little bit. I don't know. I don't know about this image. You know what? I'm going to work out that image later. Let's take a picture of it. Let's take a nice picture of this sort of open up spool tower library. I am going to, to do that first though. Um, something people talk about a lot in cycles is the number of uh, samples. Now, used to be if you wanted a really good image in the dark, you'd have to do thousands of samples. But we've not. Newer versions of Blender have a cool denoiser. Because otherwise you see these speckles around here, you'd get them in your final image. Let's go to the compositor. Sometimes you need to click use nodes. You need to then go to this thing that looks like stacked up pictures. We want to enable denoising data, which gives me loads of stuff. This is the information from my render layer, from my image. This is the output I get. We want to monkey about with it along this line. So let's go A. Let's put in a, what's it called? A convert no, it's a filter, isn't it? Denoise. Plug in the denoise node. If you just drag it over, then things connect. But image to image, image to image. But also, I want the denoising normal, and I want the denoising albedo. Now I can make a lovely clear image with probably even less than the 128 samples, rather than doing hundreds or thousands. If I render this now really quickly, do 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 do. I get an image with an alpha background, but actually I might want Blender to do a little bit more than just give me an image with an alpha background, so I don't have to open it up with an image editor later. That's why compositing is important. So let's bring in a oh, colour, alpha over. That is going to let me put more images over the top. Then let's put another input. Let's put in an image input. And then let's open up the image that I want, which is going to be this background image I can share with you. Um, and bring it in over the top. But I can't see what I've got. So let's also put in an output node. Let's give me a viewer. So otherwise I don't have to look at the render. Let's split that. So now I can see I've put them the wrong way around. Because I've got the background over the foreground. Let's swap over these nodes. Boom. I now have an image done. And you know what? I don't even have to render it. I would. Let's render it again. Normally it would recomposite it automatically. But I closed down this window. So now it will render. Boom. And that is how we get a product image through all those steps. I think that is everything you need to know. Um, if I wanted to as well, um, put another thing like a logo over the top, I would use another alpha over node and just chain them up because I think something we might want to do is that. Um, v, V lets you zoom in and out. V and V, oh, it, no, V and Alt V let you zoom in and out on the viewer because it 
So V and Alt V, that's good to know. Okay. Uh, I think that's everything. Bye. It has finished now. Bye.